Late at night, a man and a woman run anxiously, they can't even care about the zombies in front of them because there are worse things chasing them behind. They were none other than Connie and Virgil, who had been fleeing together. They tried to get into the house to hide. Connie tried to open the door, but it seemed the lock had rusted. Suddenly, a zombie lurched toward Connie from behind, but Virgil swiftly pulled it away. However, the zombie redirected its attack toward Virgil. It was too close for Virgil to pull out his dagger, and he had to hold on for dear life to keep the zombies from biting him. Just when Virgil couldn't hold on much longer, Connie finally slammed the door open. Due to inertia, they both fell to the ground, rather than immediately assisting her companion. Connie rushed to close the door because once the zombies outside entered, no one would survive. Virgil, after a struggle, finally pulled out his knife and dealt with the zombie. It was so dangerous just now. Connie quickly locked the door and, to be cautious, used her body to block it. Being deaf, she couldn't hear the outside commotion but could sense the increasing pressure against the door. Their earlier noise had attracted nearby zombies. It only took about 10 minutes for a swarm of zombies to form outside the house. As the dawn gradually broke, Connie observed through the door crack. Outside the zombies were still on the prowl, but thankfully there was no sign of the monster that had chased them before. Now all they had to do was wait for the zombies to disperse and they could leave. Connie sighed in relief. Compared to the zombies, the eerie unknown creatures were more frightening. Virgil was not idle either. He went upstairs, checking room after room to ensure there were no threats inside the house. After about 10 minutes, Virgil completed his thorough inspection both inside and outside. He also gestured to Connie in his unskilled sign language, telling her not to worry, that the house was safe. Seeing Connie still tense, Virgil picked up a notebook and wrote, You need to rest. We've been on the run for days, and you haven't slept. I'll keep watch. But Connie still shook her head she also wrote a line in the notebook. Virgil sighed, realizing Connie was perhaps overly sensitive, but he abandoned the idea of convincing her to rest. Connie wasn't mistrusting Virgil, being deaf. She possessed a unique perception of danger, she always felt like there were eyes watching them in the house. To be on the safe side, Connie decided to check the house again. Immediately after, Connie arrived on the second floor. The corridor was eerily quiet, adorned with several paintings on the walls. Strangely, the eyes of the figures in the paintings had been slashed with a knife. They had no idea what the previous owners had gone through in this place. Connie, cautious and alert, thoroughly checked the corridor. Thankfully, apart from the eerie paintings, there didn't seem to be any immediate danger. Finally, she entered the bathroom, finding it empty except for some fungi on the floor, indicating long neglect. Connie looked at herself in the mirror. Nervous and haggard, she said optimistically, You look great. Don't be too anxious. After adjusting her mindset, she opened the mirrored cabinet, hoping to find something useful. The only thing in there was a bottle of antibiotics that had expired. It was then that she noticed a dark hole in the cabinet, indicating that it was hollow inside. Curiosity took over, and she leaned closer to take a look. <laughs> Connie's heart nearly jumped out of her chest. She quickly ran downstairs and woke up Virgil, gesturing to him that there was someone else in the house. Virgil was so confused he couldn't read the sign language. Connie had no choice but to write down what she had seen. However, in her panicked state, she inadvertently broke the pencil with excessive force. She felt overwhelmed at this moment, especially with the communication barrier during such a critical time. After thinking for a moment, Connie pulled out the dagger from Virgil's waist and rushed to the wall. Virgil stared blankly at the words on the wall, which he had already checked. Virgil had no choice but to follow Connie to the bathroom. He also looked into the small hole and found nothing. Virgil believed that Connie was just exhausted, resulting in hallucinations. He tried to comfort her, saying that many houses have such compartments and advised her to rest and regain her energy. Connie was on the verge of losing her mind. Why does Virgil just not believe her? She had seen it with her own eyes. After speaking, Connie walked away in big strides. She didn't want to stay in this haunted place for another moment, but as a deaf person, she couldn't hear, and when she turned back, she was surprised to find an additional door behind her. She's sure it's the guy in the cubicle. Turning her head, she looked back. Even though there was nothing in the hallway, the sense of danger grew stronger. Connie controlled her bad mood and moved a little bit towards the outside. Afraid that the thing would come out at once, she kept walking until she turned the corner and still couldn't find anything. The world of the deaf and mute is so helpless, their contact with nature can only be through sight and touch. Suddenly, she felt a slight vibration in her hand, indicating that something was approaching her. Without looking back, almost instinctively, 
Connie started running because the vibrations were getting stronger, it was hard to imagine that the one chasing her was a human, but moving around like an animal on all fours. Finally, Connie quickly reached the staircase, closed the door, and pressed her feet against the wall. The creature kept pounding on the door, occasionally letting out a beastly roar. After about five minutes, Connie felt no movement behind the door, the creature had likely given up. She felt on the verge of a breakdown, but now she had to rely on herself. She carefully descended the stairs, moving towards the lower floor. It was a small stairwell usually used for storage. As she entered the room, she noticed the floor was littered with bones. Connie felt like she couldn't breathe because these were human bones, along with backpacks and shoes, indicating that anyone who came here died, possibly even being eaten alive. Suddenly, the cabinet against the wall started shaking, though she couldn't hear, Connie was certain that the creature had arrived, with no way out. She crawled into the ventilation duct. As Connie climbed up, she realized that the duct seemed to run through the entire house, but she had no idea if there was an exit on the other side. She felt utterly helpless because she couldn't hear, she had to move forward while constantly looking back, afraid that the creature would quietly approach. As she continued, she noticed a small hole in the wall on her right. She looked in and it turned out to be a bathroom, it seemed that the creature had been hiding in this duct. After calming herself down for a moment, Connie continued moving forward. Meanwhile, Virgil had also taken refuge in a room. Now he believed everything Connie had said. The creature was right outside his door, relentlessly banging and emitting inhuman screams. It was more terrifying than a horror movie. Meanwhile Connie was groping around in the passageway when she saw a flash of light and a small hole in the wall. She saw that Virgil was moving a cupboard to block the door. The monster should be outside Virgil's door. Connie slapped the wall as hard as she could. The sight of her companion made her feel less panicky. The sound also attracted Virgil's attention. He drew the dagger at his waist and walked towards the wall warily. He thought it was likely that the monster was hiding in there. Connie tapped rhythmically to alert Virgil that she was in there, but just then the creature appeared silently in the corner of the wall and approached Virgil a little closer. Virgil was completely unaware that the monster was approaching him. Outside the wall, Connie was frantically pounding on the wall, trying to alert Virgil to watch his back. However, Virgil, hearing the noise, nervously stared at the wall, thinking that something inside was about to emerge. Meanwhile, the monster had already crept up behind him and was slowly standing up. When Connie looked over, they were already wrestling. The more she watched, the more anxious she became and even wanted to break the wall with her hands and rush out to help. Virgil was in a chokehold and couldn't move. The cannibals were too strong and he was going to die soon. Virgil mustered all his strength to reach for a knife. While Connie pounded on the wall to divert the monster's attention, seizing the opportunity, Virgil thrust the knife into the cannibal's abdomen, relieving the crisis. The cannibals didn't die. He fought back the pain and crawled to a corner of the room. Connie breathed a sigh of relief and continued pounding on the wall. She had thought that Virgil had figured out she was inside, but little did she know that Virgil still believed there was another cannibal inside the wall. Connie desperately tried to widen the hole, fearing that if they didn't break free from the wall, they might be killed by their own companions. Connie anxiously tries to break through the wall, but Virgil, seeing that the hole is getting bigger and bigger, is ready to strike at any time. What a false alarm it turned out to be. Fortunately, at the critical moment, Virgil recognized Connie's bracelet. Later that night, near the house, Carol and the others followed the trail and found themselves here. After crossing the grassland, they arrived at a crossroads, unsure which way to go. Eventually, they let Kelly decide based on her intuition. Kelly, after some thought, successfully chose the opposite path. However, something eerie occurred. When Connie and Virgil had arrived, there was clearly a mailbox along the road, but now it was hidden in the grass. Virgil and Connie sat together, analyzing that the creatures pursuing them were likely humans who had lost their humanity. The house they were in seemed to be an obvious bait. The mailbox along the road was intentionally placed to lure survivors to seek refuge. Much like driving prey into a trap, it was the calm before the storm. Virgil handed his knife to Connie, saying, If those cannibals come again, don't worry about what happens to me. Just keep running and don't look back. Connie has a good heart. How could she leave her companion? She placed the knife on the ground and gestured. If we go out, we go out together. I won't let you give up now. After that she made a pact with Virgil to get out alive. Just as they reached an agreement, the hissing of the cannibals came from outside the house. And there were many of them. It was time to fight. Virgil hands Connie the dagger and he picks up a stick. Staying in the room meant waiting for death. So they chose to fight their way out. They took a deep breath, looked at each other, pulled open the locker, 
opened the door to the room and rushed out together. The corridor echoed with howls, but there were no cannibals in sight. It was the perfect time to leave. They reached the end of the corridor, but the door wouldn't open. They had to find another exit. Suddenly, several cannibals crawled out from the corners of the room. They hurriedly escaped into another room. Just arrived here, a female cannibal stabbed Virgil three or four times in the back with a wooden stick. The cannibals retreated with their wounds. Connie checked Virgil's injuries, severe but not fatal. She struggled to drag Virgil and continued their escape. After a lot of trouble, they finally arrived at the door. Before they could catch their breath, a cannibal descended the stairs, fixating on them like a hunting lion. Another one appeared in the corridor. Connie shielded Virgil, quickly contemplating a strategy. Suddenly, she had an idea. Connie dragged a zombie's corpse over and swiftly smeared its entrails on herself. At this moment, the cannibals were already approaching, and two more cannibals came from the other side of the passage. As they lunged, Connie swung the door open, zombies poured in, the cannibals started to retreat, but two of them were still pounced on by the zombies. Although these cannibals have lost their humanity, they still have team spirit. When they saw their companions in trouble, they rushed forward without hesitation, Connie closed her eyes, and the entire room was filled with screams and a strong smell of blood. Three minutes later, she helped Virgil walk out. However, Connie's body was too weak. After a few steps, they both fell to the ground. She tried to lift Virgil again, but he insisted that she should go on without him, as he was only slowing her down. It was at this moment that a cannibal caught up with them. Connie, without fleeing, continued to shield Virgil. Kelly arrived just in time. They walked in one direction for a while without finding any traces, so they turned back to track in the opposite direction. Kelly happened to rescue her sister. The two sisters looked at each other with tears in their eyes. One had endured torment outside, longing to return home, while the other had been searching and waiting at home. Now they were finally reunited. Next, they had to return to Alexandria's safe zone because it seemed that a storm was approaching. Until 2 a.m., they finally reached home, but the storm had already arrived, and it looks like tonight's storm is a little unusual, like it's building up to destroy everything. Aaron and others gathered in a house, reinforcing windows and doors to avoid being swept away by the violent winds. Connie had changed into clean clothes, and Virgil had his wounds bandaged. The thunder roared throughout the night, and the wind made the house creak. Many children upstairs were scared and crying. Judith comforted the older children, telling them not to be afraid, as there would be a rainbow after the storm. Suddenly, a gust of wind blew open the door. Aaron quickly rushed to deal with the tree trunks, and others came to help close the door. Even Judith actively participated. Looking through the window, they saw that the windmill had caught fire, probably struck by the earlier lightning. They also noticed a piece of iron blown onto the street. Rosita's expression wasn't good because it meant that there was a breach in the wall, and zombies could come in at any time. After a while, Aaron called a meeting to discuss the situation. The community's situation is somewhat dire. Not only is the windmill on fire, but there's also a section missing from the wall. So, they must go out now to address these two issues. They needed to form three teams, two to go out to extinguish the fire and repair the wall, and one to stay behind to protect those inside the house. The operation is voluntary. Aaron had just finished speaking and Carol volunteered to lead a crew to fix the fence. Connie, who has a sense of responsibility, immediately raised her hand and said she would go along, following suit. Kelly, Magna, and others actively participated. Even Virgil wanted to contribute, but he was rejected by the group due to his injuries. Rosita asked Virgil to stay behind with her to protect the people inside the house. Aaron took charge of leading a team to extinguish the fire. The group started to get ready. Judith approached, expressing her willingness to help. However, Carol told her, you can be more helpful here, protecting your little siblings and making sure they're not too scared. Judith could only nod. Aaron comforted his daughter Grace, telling her to stay with her friends. He emphasized that in the apocalypse, everyone fears death, but someone has to step up and fight for their family. After they left, the remaining people continued reinforcing doors and windows. Grace, envious, told Judith, I really admire you. You never seem to be scared. I wish I could do that. Judith comforted her. Actually, I'm scared sometimes too, but my mom taught me that the more scared you are, the calmer you should be. That way, you can run faster and fight better. Grace didn't seem so scared after hearing that, and she brandished Judith's long knife. This scene was seen by Virgil on the other side of the room. In Michonne's absence, Judith and her brother missed their mom a lot. Sometimes, other kids would mock her, saying their mom would never come back. 
and she kept the sadness inside. Now, hearing Virgil's words, Judith felt much better, it strengthened her determination to become a powerful and resilient warrior, just like her mom.